Nothing is wrong with lolly content. And to establish what I mean by content, I mean lolly in all forms. Anime, manga, hentai, and all forms of lolly. I think the problem that a lot of people have with lolly is that they are little kids. But this is only slightly accurate. The problem with this statement is that it shows an inability to separate fantasy from reality. A lot of people that like lollies are not attracted to real life kids in any way, shape or form. If you do not know what lolly is, and you don't want to find out, maybe don't watch this video. But basically, I'm going to go into this a bit later. I had an argument with people on Twitter the other day, and I basically said that uh, Jordan Peterson's cultural Marxism conspiracy theory is like inherently anti-Semitic, and a bunch of people with anime profile pictures started criticizing me, and then I realized basically all of them were accounts dedicated to posting lolly stuff and defending lolly. Lolly referring to Japanese art, whether that be in manga, anime, or just like drawings, that often depicts young girls and often sexualizes them. That's what lolly is in a nutshell. And surprisingly, despite this being banned in multiple countries and being illegal in multiple countries, there's actually a lot of anime fans that not only defend it and defend its inclusion in various different Japanese animes, there is also a lot of communities on places like Reddit still that just discuss this thing and post different pictures. So I wanted to use this video to talk about general sexualization in Japanese media and I want to talk about something I have a personal experience of in terms of like Metal Gear Solid games and then I want to talk about stuff that of course I've researched today but strangely enough don't actually have any knowledge of and that is lolly content and how that is reflective of certain things in japan which i wish i hadn't found out about until today but we're going to discuss that all in the video of course if you're sensitive to discussions of things like abuse or sexualization of minors or just general sexualization of women when i talk about male guest solid i will be talking about sexual assault as well so just keep that all in mind if this is a bit of a trigger for you so basically how the video is going to go so we're going to talk about sexualization in western media and japanese media then talk about metal gear solid and my experience of it and then shift more to anime going down into the lollycon rabbit hole and then also talking about how this is partially normalized in japan as well so all of that coming up for you today but before we go any further please like the video and in the comments i guess the question is what is the worst sexualization you've seen in, I guess, any media? It can be Japanese media, and since we're talking about things like anime, you can tell me which anime is the worst this stuff, but just generally, of course, Western media and Japanese media have a problem with sexualizing women. Also, consider subscribing. For every 5k, we get a new chocolate orange. We're closing in on the 80k orange. Help me get that in the next month. Also, check out my social media at The Cavernacle on Twitter, on Instagram. Consider supporting me on Patreon. I want to build up as many one to three dollar patrons as possible. The benefits of which are getting access to the private patrons Discord server and my Nintendo Switch friend code. And of course, subscribe to The Cavernacle Extra where I will post my live streams and I will start live streaming again next week. The heat wave just finished in the UK. It's still very, very hot, but we had like 39 degrees yesterday, wildfires, all the rest of it. Really, really depressing and just really hard to cope with. Then all the two days are sitting in front of a fan. Also, the wasp nest is no longer in my wall, so I don't have to hold the microphone, although I am having some sort of like phantom pain from not holding it. I did kind of get used to it and I kind of actually like having something to hold. I do talk a lot with my hands, but I kind of liked having one holding something. I don't know. So all of that out the way, I guess I want to start this video and before we like delve into like specific Japanese art and the sexualization of women, I wanted this video to be more an examination of why Japan sexualizes different things and certain things rather than acting like Japanese society as a whole are just full of nonces and we in the civilized West, you know, we're not like those Japanese. We don't sexualize women in media. There is no sexualization of minors or anything like that because that's simply not true. I do think Japan has a specific problem with it, which we're going to discuss towards the end of the video. But to say that they have a problem with it and we don't, I think, is inherently false. I think a lot of our coverage of celebrity inherently sexualizes people who are under the age of 18. And I think that's gotten worse with social media and, I guess, more intimate access to celebrities who are often 
under the age of 18. And it's obviously really, really sinister that often groups of men wait until certain celebrities turn 18 to then start posting sexualized things about them. Now in terms of just like general entertainment, of course things like Me Too and this discussion of the sexualization of women in particular in media has been a lot bigger in America and the UK. And while Japan has had its own Me Too movement, it hasn't been as successful. And although it has had some progress, it hasn't been, I guess, as big of a success in some ways as it in America and the UK, where people are now just being a bit more sensitive to how women are depicted. But of course, in the West and countries and Hollywood and TV, video games, very, very long history of objectifying women and gaming. Lara Croft for years and years was one of the most sexualized characters out there only really changed with the reboot where she is still like very, very pretty. And I would say like sexually attractive. She's not like grossly over-sexualized like she used to be and kind of be this like male fantasy of this action hero. Not saying it's been the only way women have been depicted far from it, but there still is this like male gaze in cinema and I think one of the most like notable examples that springs to my mind is like Transformers with Megan Fox or just you know Michael Bay movies in general and I think there is a place for sexualization of just humans in general but more often than not what actually happens is women just get sexualized and objectified for no reason like not related to the plot, not trying to make any point about our society, not trying to make any point about how women are depicted. They're simply depicted in an overtly sexualized manner just to sell the product. And you can see that there is a big element of Western audiences that still do want this. Remember that stupid meme where they put makeup on Aloy from Horizon saying that, you know, Aloy is ugly. Like the Forbidden West version of Aloy is ugly and not feminine. We must put makeup on her, like, you know, eyeliner, mascara, lip gloss, lipstick, all this stuff while this character is meant to be running around the desert. And apparently that is what women should be like in games. And of course you also had that massive backlash to the Tifa redesign in Final Fantasy VII Remake, where I would say she's still like fairly sexualized, but just not as over the top as she was in the pixelated form she used to have. And of course, you know, the 2D artwork that went with that. So I think the Aloy thing specifically just shows this ridiculous standard because I've just finished Forbidden West and Aloy is like both very attractive visually, but also like an attractive personality. She's quite a bit better looking than your like average person. I don't see someone like that and think, oh, she must wear more makeup to make herself more appealing. Funny fact is actually, if you wear the Kaja kind of war paint in Horizon, it basically is makeup. You can get stuff under your eyes, you can get like lipstick, quite funny. You actually kind of can do this in the game. Not that this would ever meet gamer standards. And of course, back in 2013, you did actually have a lot of people crying about Lara Croft changing her outfit where she wasn't wearing really skimpy shorts and didn't have like, absolutely huge objectified breasts. So people got mad about that too. And of course we couldn't talk about the male gaze and the backlash to certain characters without talking about Abby from The Last of Us 2, where these types of right-wing nerds got really outraged that there was a woman with visibly big muscles and a woman who was actually, I'd say, harsh features, but actually quite attractive. But because she wasn't conventionally sexualized, even though she actually did have sex in the game, these people couldn't handle it. And it speaks to how there's either a significant element or maybe even the majority of men who do want to be pandered to with these sexualized female characters, even if the sexualization is not doing anything for the plot or to make a point. Now on that note, and I think it's one of the best examples of this, you guys will know I'm a massive Metal Gear Solid fan. And I think Metal Gear Solid often lets down its female characters by the over-sexualization of them. And I think Quiet is the best example of that. Now let's talk about Metal Gear Solid and sexualization because I don't think it's as clear cut as, you know, Quiet is overly sexualized and it feels like it doesn't really have a point. So Metal Gear Solid has a bit of a crossover with like anime. You have like Otacon being like this otaku, literally Otacon, his name is Otaku Convention. Are you an otaku too? Using science for peace? That's only an anime. Call me Otacon. 
Otakon. It stands for Otaku Convention. An otaku is a guy like me who likes Japanimation. I became a scientist because I wanted to make robots like the ones in the Japanese animes. And generally you kind of have this humor that Solid Snake and Naked Snake are perverts. And I think that is fine. Like, I don't inherently think this is the worst. Like Snake can take photos of like scantily clad posters of women. Otacon will comment on it. First up. Oh, this is a... Uh, what? Nothing. It's nothing. Uh, but th this isn't a photo of Metal Gear anyway. Sorry, but you're gonna have to go back and shoot another set. I'll just make a backup of this one. What's next? More of these? Is that all you think about? Hey, what you like is your business. Just get those Metal Gear pictures. And of course you have Eva, who is this Cold War spy, who uses her, like, sexual attractiveness to actually seduce Snake and steal the Philosopher's legacy from him. I mean, I think you could criticize maybe the fact that the player themselves can look down Eva's top, but at the same time, I would be a bit more sympathetic to this depiction because it's indicative of like James Bond and Cold War spies and just general spies using sex as part of their jobs is something that happens today. In shows like The Americans, I think it's really well done. I think Metal Gear Solid 3 kind of walks that line maybe a bit better. And of course you have characters like The Boss who really aren't sexualized at all. They're like this mother figure, really, really great uh, female character overall. And even when she does unzip her top to show her scar to you, I don't think there's anything sexual in that. There is some weird stuff with Meryl from Metal Gear Solid 1 and doing certain things so you can see her run around just about her trousers on and stuff so there is some like smut to it and you do have characters who are by design like overly sexualized like all those female villains in metal gear solid 4 like after you defeat them you can like take pictures of them and they are very sexualized sniper wolf especially in the remake like her outfit is a bit sexualized with the choker and the large breast but i wouldn't say these are the worst things ever, especially the context of like a generally sexist media. Yes, I do agree that they are informed by the male gaze and do have sexism in them. I don't think they're as bad as Quiet. Now, before we go any further, I will say I think the pushback to Quiet did inform Kojima and Yoji Shinkawa depiction of women in Death Stranding, where again, there is this kind of like nudity element incorporated in characters like fragile but i don't think it's ever played for any type of sexuality i don't know if you guys agree with that assessment with fragile but because her entire body is essentially covered by the time fall which ages her let me know down in the comments but yes let's get to quiet so generally i feel like quiet is a very very good character and often people say well quiet breathes for her skin photosynthesis all that stuff which is true quiet does breathe through her skin just like the end and just like code talker Notice how the end and Code Talker aren't nude, aren't wearing skimpy clothes, aren't being objectified. Why is it just quiet? Now, I'm going to read a Kotaku article, which came out recently and actually reveals some details about quiet that I never knew before, including the justification for making her like this. But even based on all the arguments about that quiet has this parasite where she has to, you know, basically act like a plant and she breathes for her skin, I think she's just crazily overly sexualized just you know when you're in a helicopter she'll stand up her breasts are very visible you can zoom in on them she generally just wants snakes affection and constantly poses in a sexual manner and again i feel like there's a variation of the outfit that they could have made which while keeps her wearing less clothes isn't really really sexualized and of course part of quiet's plot is also she nearly gets raped by soviet soldiers and i think it leaves a bit of a bad taste in my mouth when that's part of the plot when she has been objectified so much by the game itself to the player and i just don't accept there wasn't a better way to do this and like i'm saying sexualization of female characters isn't anything unique to japan or japanese media but i just want to talk about this from my perspective and you'll see some kind of bad comments from kojima and just the team that he worked with. So by Ashley Barden, Metal Gear turned 35, but Quiet's character design marks a timeless controversy. So Metal Gear Solid 5 Sniper is forever wearing a bikini. Metal Gear artist Yoji Shinkawa pictures Quiet as naked in some early concept art, a meditation he performs with many of his female characters. 
It's a ridiculous practice. Another confirmation that women video game characters are designed with man's libido front and center. But in the peculiar case of Quiet, Shinkara might have been onto something. If Quiet's final design had been fully committed to her distinct backstory, I think Metal Gear could have presented something more compelling to the canon than another hot video game girl designed to sell collectibles. A black bikini, torn fishnet stockings, boots, gloves, a tactical belt slouched against a flat, muscled stomach. Since Metal Gear Solid 5: The Phantom Pain released in 2015, Quiet's default outfit has been heavily criticized by players and defended by the series creator Kojima. On his English Twitter in 2013, Kojima generously identified Quiet as an antithesis to excessively exposed women characters and shook his finger at the tractors, saying they'd all be ashamed of their words and deeds upon playing the game. Playing the game revealed that Quiet simply has to wear that bikini you see because she's riddled with parasites. So writer Michael Thompson noted in 2015 that Quiet sexualization doesn't seem to be acknowledged by anyone in the game world. She has no express libido, nor do any of the game's bumbling, inelegant men. But while hiding behind the parasites, the game encourages players to delight in Quiet's body. We're made to watch her unnecessarily jump out of a helicopter to rive around in some rain puddles, her body glistening as if dipped in perfumed oil. MGS5's camera loves that body, occasionally switching to first person to better observe functory jiggling of Quiet's breasts. Her breasts, by the way, translated well into squishy action figure that could be push and lifted, Kojima said lol. While Raiden ran around nude in Metal Gear Solid 2, completely on display aside from both hands in the front of his pelvis, the camera stayed politely back. The game communicated that Raiden's nakedness was not was out of necessity, nothing else. Quiet and her compelling backstory would have benefited from the same somber eyes. But Kojima couldn't help himself from conjuring sex. I've been ordering Yoji to make the character more erotic and he did it well. Kojima's English Twitter said about Quiet on September 4th, 2013. The initial target is to make you want to do cosplay or figurine to sell well, he continued, later posting a close-up of Quiet's pose, stockings covered up as an example of cosplay inspiration. And talk about the rape scene, but in introducing sexual violence as an obstacle for Quiet, Metal Gear decides that Quiet's body isn't the reason for her power. In fact, it's a liability. Being a woman made Quiet more vulnerable than her male peers, despite being both stronger and faster than them. The game's trickiest outfits to unlock are the protective ones that cover Quiet completely. You have to earn safety from the male gaze as her mutated body isn't enough on its own. So if Kojima was trying to make some sort of commentary on how women are sexualized, in video games or just Japanese media. I think he actually failed pretty badly on this. And Kojima's games are complex in that there are very good non-sexualized female characters, but I think this type of like smart kind of undermines the story. And I don't know, you know, I like Quiet as a character. I feel like this is always just kind of undermined her. And it is a cool look. And you know, from an artistic standpoint, it is like a cool character design, but it is very much catered to the male gaze like every single thing about it the ripped tights the bikini like tied together like it could come off at any moment i hope kojima is better than that and from death stranding i think it's pretty clear he's evolved on this front i thought it was interesting to criticize some sort of japanese media i know now for something i don't know as well anime but of course i'm very familiar with anime character design and it's very very much like quiet Loads and loads of characters are just sexualized for no reason, mainly focusing on having like huge breasts. And sadly, as we're gonna get into this video, they often sexualize younger characters as well and minors. And I think now in the West, we've kind of normalized this kind of artistic style for Japanese properties. But I don't think it should really be given a big pass just because it's cartoons, because it is still sexualizing women and is making how desirable they are as sexual objects are part of, you know, if they're a good character or not. And oftentimes it just feels needless, like it did with Quiet. Like the only reason you are doing this is because you want men interested in the character or you personally found it attractive. So sexualization of female characters, like I said, is a problem in the West and Japan. It's not unique to Japan. But something that is fairly unique to Japan is this more normalization of nonce behavior in public. And like I said, there is this problem in the West as well. But I think it's fair to say the relation between Lolly and actual Japanese sexualization of minors in a very public way is linked together. And I do think it's a more unique trait that Japan has. Now, like I said, I tweeted the other day that Jordan Peterson was fascist to Jason and then loads of... Uh, Lolly fans came after me because 
You know, nothing more surprising than a fascist lolly fan. And I say anti-communism as an ideology is racist. I'm not talking about people who don't want to be communists or don't like communism. I'm talking about people whose worldview is buying into historical McCarthyism and believing leftists are destroying everything. You know, obviously a lot of this is anti-Semitic. Then I get comments from people like this, Ratio, Alona's Omni-Chan, and you can see in their profile picture, pretty young drawing of a female anime character. And I just explained to them, if you're anti-communist, there's no way you don't believe in either anti-Semitic conspiracy theories or racism against Slavs, Asians, or Africans. American anti-communism is synonymous with anti-Asian racism currently, combined with anti-Semitism, Soros, cultural Marxism, conspiracies. And I say, I mean, I'm talking to a nonce here, don't know why I'm wasting my time. And then some other person jumps in with an imperial Japanese fascist flag and is another person who is defending Lolly. Now, like you'll see in this little Reddit thing I stumbled across, a lot of their justification for being into Lolly is that it's just drawing. So, uh, no bro, calm down, your last remaining brain cells, they're just characters, a bunch of lines and pixels on a screen created on a computer on some paper with a pen and a pencil. And just one more thing I thought was funny, uh, should Lolly be legal? on the Destiny subreddit and uh, most people saying yes, always. So of course, Lolly refers to Lolita. So Lolita is a 1955 novel written by Vladimir Nabokov. The novel is notable for its controversial subject, the protagonist and an unreliable narrator. A French middle-aged literature professor under the pseudonym Humbert Humbert is obsessed with an American 12-year-old girl, Dolores Hayes, whom he molests after he becomes her stepfather. Lolita is his private nickname for Dolores. The novel was adapted into a film by Stanley Kubrick in 1962 and another film by Adrian Lin in 1997. And here is a definition of lolicon. In Japanese popular culture, lolicon is a genre of fictional media in which young girl characters appear in romantic or sexual contexts. Refers to Lolita complex. Also refers to desire and affection for such characters and fans of such characters and works. Associated with unrealistic and stylized imagery within manga, anime, and video games, Lolicon in otaku culture is understood as distinct from desires for realistic depictions of girls. So there are, of course, problems with anime sexualizing women in general, but I guess those problems aren't as apparent when the women are age appropriate, over 18. It gets pretty disgusting and more bizarre that there are so many defenders of cartoons sexualizing school children, minors, and all the rest of it, and people somehow acting that this isn't a problem at all. Like, it's just normal to enjoy that stuff and no one should be concerned. And in fact, according to the Destiny subreddit, it should all be legal, despite the fact that in many Western countries, it is not legal and Japan itself has had crackdowns on this stuff. So what I want to do in the next part of the video is just discuss Lolly a tiny bit more and then just link it to Japanese society in general and how there is this real subculture of fetishizing minors and schoolgirls, which actually has a whole industry of going to like these cafes and bars and actually being waited upon by school age girls in school uniforms. Yes, I did not know this was a thing until today, but now it makes that Kill Bill scene make a lot more sense. So uh, by Flip Japan Guide, sexualization of young Japanese girls through anime, manga, and idol groups. So there is an estimation that 30 to 40% of anime and manga have sexual themes, and a lot of it includes underage characters. Whether it's something subtle, like having a gust of wind blow up a character's skirt to reveal her panties, or something overt where the character engages in sex acts. So another article by Warwick Women's Careers Society by Julia Tattersall in November 18th, 2020. Considering that Japan is the birthplace of manga and anime, it is unsurprising that its media is plastered with cartoon illustrations ranging from fictional characters of superpowers to mythological creatures. However, deep within this art style lies a rather controversial genre Lollicon. Comics with these types of images have been banned in the UK. However, in Japan, it remains legal based on the premise that the images are, are illustrated, not photographic. In fact, this key feature of Lollicon is a large part of the reason it's become so popular. This element separates the illustrations from reality and apparently justifies the sexualization of minors. That said, Lollicon has never truly been deemed socially acceptable with the Japanese term being almost synonymous with being a nonce. Yet despite its underlying perverted roots, 
These depictions of underage girls continue to gain exposure in Japanese media, yet Japan takes its industry a step further and undoubtedly a step too far. Another popular genre is called Jaku Iro, which involves no nudity. It's nevertheless overtly sexual. It tends to fe feature minors with one producer admitting to filming girls as young as six. In fact, it is the younger girls that are the most profitable. In some cases, their videos can earn five times more than those of elder counterparts. Yet, as long as there's no nudity, this remains legal. So how is that for absolutely disgusting um, capitalism there? There is equally the opportunity for men to establish physical relationships with adolescents. Josie Kosai, Ali in Tokyo, which we're going to talk about a bit more, operates as Japan's red light district. Here, men can pay to spend time amongst minors with services ranging from a walk in the park to more intimate options. Although once a legitimate and legal industry, Tokyo Metropolitan Government banned under 18s from working on the street last year, thankfully. Nevertheless, businesses here continue, except now women dressed in school uniform are of age. Clearly, despite the law attesting that the sexualization of minors is wrong, the fetish is so entrenched into Japanese society that it cannot be removed that easily. So talking about JK cafes and stuff, I found two good articles which actually talk to people in the industry, involved in the industry, and people trying to shut down the industry. So by Kieran Varley on the BBC, there's a street in Tokyo known as JK Alley. Their teenagers in school uniforms sell their time to passers-by while their minders hover in the background. Men pay to hold hands, go for a walk, or have a cup of coffee with the girls. Some even pay to sleep on the girls' lap. I can't even believe this is real. This is all legitimate, above board, and legal. This is before the age restrictions came in in 2020. In the new BBC Free documentary, Young Sex for Sale in Japan, Stacey Dooley visits a JK cafe in Tokyo. In this bar, £35 will get you 40 minutes of a girl of your choice and unlimited booze. In some cafes, men can also pay... For walking dates, time with the girls away from the cafe, what happens at that time is up to the girls and their clients. One customer shows Stacy his favourite girl, a 17-year-old, with long light brown hair and a thick fringe. He likes her because she's good at talking dirty and pretends to be pure. This is really, really gross. I'm going to have to have a shower after this. Another customer tells Stacy the age gap thing for some people is off-putting, but in Japan, maybe it's our culture. Our attitude is quite different. It is estimated that nearly 5,000 genuine schoolgirls work in these legal cafes in Japan. So then in a Guardian article, schoolgirls for sale, why, why Tokyo struggles to stop the JK business. So to stop vulnerable girls from going into this industry, there have been some charities targeting them to try and stop them. Run by the charity Colaba since October 2018, the pink bus appears in chosen spaces in the city once a week. Volunteers hope to use it to provide a safe space for school-age girls at risk of being lured into JK businesses as the schoolgirl theme services are known. JK business scouts tend to be men in their 20s and 30s. They are very aware of trends and are good at knowing the girls' economic status by looking at their clothes and makeup. Poverty and low self-esteem are often factors in the manipulation of young girls by scouts. The fetishization of Japanese schoolgirls and Japanese culture has been linked by some academics to a 1985 song called Please Don't Take Off My School Uniform, released by the female idol group on Yanko Club and re-released by no less mainstream a group than AKB48, one of the highest earning music performers in Japan. In 2016, the UN Special Rapporteur raised serious concerns about Japan's JK industry and highlighted the lack of up-to-date official data, calling for a comprehensive strategy to tackle the root causes of this exploitation, saying it's a worrying example of children being treated as sexual commodities. We almost allow men to say, yeah, I'm attracted to young children as young as 14 and 15, says Shihoko Fujiwara, founder of Lighthouse, a charity working to end human trafficking in Japan. Even on TV, comedians will say, I like to date junior high school girls. People make fun of those comments, but they are still made. So just talking about some more people trying to tackle this. Superintendent Hiroyuki Nakada, deputy manager of the juvenile support division, says the police are confident that their strategies are working, but says educating children on the dangers is also key. It's not enough just to control. Fujiwara believes that the government trying to crack down on JK businesses may look good on the surface, but does nothing to ban other types of exploitation. She also points out that more attention should be paid to buyers and to try and to change the mindset of a society that accepts the commodification of children. So like I said, I don't want to paint Japan as this like monolith and that like every person in Japan 
is perfectly happy with JK businesses because it's clear officials, charities, they're all trying to do things to stop this practice. But just like with things you hear in Afghanistan about the abuse of young boys by the Afghan military when the US were helping them, stuff like this just so disgusting and really makes you lose a bit of faith in humanity that this stuff is just so normalized you can just visibly in public go and pay for the services of a teenage girl wearing a school uniform like that's totally normal and of course lots of people would probably judge these people lots of people would probably say how disgusting but there is a normalization to a degree that this business was able to thrive for so long and is only recently being regulated where the people in there have to actually be 18 or older but still the whole thing of them being minors is still apparent and in my mind this type of stuff with the jk businesses and cafes links very strongly to lollycon and just anime in general having this problem of sexualizing minors but also just like these jk businesses who are sexualized most in these animes it's usually school children in school uniforms and like i said probably my first exposure to this was kill bill where we actually i think we see one of these jk cafes because the character in it and the assassin in it is i think only 14 years old so it's obviously something that the west has known about for a long long time and the police actually did crack down on this a lot just before the olympics because they knew how bad it would look but again the first time i heard of this was today and i think lolly in anime is reflective of this certain element of japanese culture that does not mind the commodification of young bodies and while like they said in the article there isn't anything like inherently sexual going on even before the regulations came in this whole thing was part of some sort of fetish and a disgusting perversion. While even if you're just getting like coffee with them, you can see how this is kind of like normalizing predatory noncy behavior. And like I said, I'm not being a hypocrite. I know there is so much noncing and commodification in Western countries, especially of younger females. I'm not saying that's not a thing, but in different societies, there is different tolerance for public displays of this stuff because we all know loads of countries have problems with predatory behavior of men on female minors noncing all the rest of it but the difference often is how much is this tolerated in public and it's clear in japan it has had this problem for a long time where this predatory behavior of men on young women and predominantly young girls is tolerated to a degree where men in public in the middle of the day will pay to go in these JK businesses and get coffee with a minor wearing a school uniform. And I think the sexualization of women and other groups in media is linked to how we sexualize people in society. And in Japan's case, this is why this like lollicon stuff has translated to anime. Because anime as like one of the biggest cultural exports of Japan is often reflects Japanese culture and reflects Japanese attitudes towards things. And in this case, certain people's attitudes towards minors. If you made it this far, let me know what you guys think down in the comments as well. And thank you for watching.